get started. Thank you very much, Andrea. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Andrew Gruber. I'm the Executive Director of the Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, to make sure you know which meeting you're in, you're in the WFRC new member orientation here. Uh, we've got folks that are new members. We've actually probably got some folks that are on or will be joining us that have been involved for some period of time. Uh, you might be in a new position now or a new member of a different committee with WFRC. Regardless of why you're here, we welcome you. We appreciate your uh, participation. And I'm gonna start off at the very beginning. I'll probably say this at the end too, that we uh, thank you so much for your service, uh, particularly those of you that are elected officials. Um, you have the hard jobs. You put yourself out there. Most of you that run for office, you don't need this work, right? You don't have to do it, but you do it because you care about your community. Um, and you work so hard and you're the ones that are getting grabbed in the supermarket or a church or wherever you might be and saying, people saying, hey, I wanna to talk to you about this. And it's really an honor for us uh, on WFRC, the staff to be able to work with you um, and think about things. You all, when you participate in WFRC, you're thinking about your individual community, of course. But when you sort of put your WFRC hat on, it means that you're thinking about your community within a broader context across the county, across the entirety of the region. Um, and uh, that has so much to do with the way that we do things at WFRC. We are uh, the Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, and the, the reason we emphasize, and in fact, the reason, reason an organization like ours even exists in the first place is to, pro is to coordinate and bring together communities from across the region, because that's the way that our lives are lived. Um, our residents, you know, they go to jobs, they go to school, they shop, they go for recreation, and they're crossing municipal boundaries and county boundaries all the time. Our economy, our transportation, our housing demands, our air quality, all of these are issues that cut across regional boundaries. And so what we try to do at WFRC is um, help you to do the best job serving your individual community, but within that broader regional context. Uh, and we also, uh, something else that's somewhat unique about the way WFRC approaches things is the time horizon that we operate on. Um, you know, sometimes elected officials get accused of thinking only along an, a, um, an electoral time horizon, right? A four year cycle. That's an important time horizon to think about. Uh, we think short term also, but we look, we look long term. We look at the growth trends and the projections for where people are going to live and how they're going to travel and what the economy is going to be over the course of not just years, but even uh, decades. So when you put your WFRC hat on, you're thinking regionally, you're thinking long term and about how the decisions we make today impact the long term quality of life for our community and our residents. Because isn't that really what it's about? That's why you're all in office, right? Yeah. It's not just about what's happening today but making great decisions, the best decisions you can to make sure that we have terrific quality of life for all of our communities uh, for decades to come. So with that um, uh, sort of generalized background, here's our objective. We're gonna take about an hour. Um, and uh, some of the folks that are here from WFRC staff are already probably thinking, Gruber, you're not doing what you told us to do which is be succinct. <laughs> I said to everybody on staff, there's a lot of information to present and our folks here that are joining us for the new member orientation, we don't need to tell them everything about WFRC. We're gonna hit some high points. And our goal is that you get an overall sense of what WFRC is, who we are, the purpose of the organization, the people, the great staff at WFRC, and that you come away with a better sense of the types of information and assistance that we have um, available to you, okay? Uh, and uh, what we want you to feel, feel comfortable with is that you, we are here for you. You can reach out to any of us, to me, to any of the members on the team. And this goes for you as well as your staff. We work really closely with your staffs. And I know there's a good number of folks on here uh, from, the, from the staffs of the, of the communities as well, cities and counties. So. Let's pop the uh, presentation up on the screen. Uh, I think Mike is driving. There we go. Um, and 
So again, here we are, our new member orientation. Um, Mike, let's just go to the, the first substantive slide here. Okay, terrific. So overall, who are we? Uh, WFRC uh, builds consensus and enhances quality of life by developing and implementing visions and plans for a well-functioning multimodal transportation system, livable communities, strong economy, and a healthy environment. That's our official mission statement. Um, and the roles that we play, as you can see here, to, to achieve that mission are convening, collaboration with our communities and our partners, uh, being a technical expert and giving you data and information that you can trust and rely on, planning for the future of the region, and then also implementing. We all know that a plan is no good if it just sits on the proverbial shelf. It has to be actually put into effect. Um, and we have resources to, and staff members that help you and your communities actually put those visions and plans into action. That's the overview. Um, WFRC, actually, you may hear these terms, AOG and, MP, and MPO. You know, in this business, we love our acronyms. Um, so WFRC is an association of governments and every county in the state of Utah is covered by um, one of seven associations of governments. Um, our role with Tooele and Morgan County are principally in that AOG, Association of Governments role. That's just bringing um, local governments together with common interests. Um, I'll say though that our, the, the majority of our work falls into our role as a metropolitan planning organization. That's actually a term that comes out of federal transportation law. Every metropolitan area in the nation has an MPO, a metropolitan planning organization. So we're a government agency uh, that serves an official role as a metropolitan planning organization. Uh, and we, our core role is to come together as an MPO and plan transportation. And in fact, our friends at UDOT and UTA are on with us. They know that they, the transportation agencies actually can't build major prod transportation projects unless and until they come through the MPO transportation planning process. Why? Because that gives you in the local governments, the local governments that make up WFRC, that um, official role for the MPO gives you an official voice and say in the transportation decisions that are made in our communities. Very, very important. Um, I see uh, we've been joined by, so, okay, what you see on the screen is some staff, but before I do staff, uh, I'm going to give a welcome to uh, our special guest today, our chairman, uh, Jeff Silvestrini, Mayor Silvestrini. Mayor Silvestrini has been busy working on an important uh, issues related to homelessness, and uh, uh, Mayor, I'm so glad you joined us. Mayor Silvestrini is our, the chair of the Wasatch Front Regional Council. I'm going to put him on the spot um, and ask if he wants to just you know, take a minute and, and say anything to the, this great group of fee people, 91 participants we have here for our new member orientation. Mayor Silvestrini. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, that's great we have 91 people. Uh, you know, I am a Utah fan, I, but I'm sitting in Mayor Troy Walker Draper's office. Uh, he, he graciously allowed me to have some privacy here. So yeah, we've been, uh, we've been uh, meeting, the Salt Lake County Conference of Mayors has been meeting to uh, address uh, some issues that, uh, our legislature is dumped on us with respect to homelessness and and uh, locating temporary resource shelters. So I apologize for being late, and I'm not going to stay either because I have to get back to that. But but I want to welcome the new people that are participating at WFRC. Um, this is a great organization. It is led by a fantastic staff, and um, and this organization does terrific planning work around our region, you know, uh, and uh, and also is responsible for uh, for um, you know, prioritizing and distributing funding with respect to uh, federal and state road projects and active transportation and transit. So uh, it's valuable. Your work is valuable. And we pride ourselves on basically uh, operating on, on a collaborative uh, method where we, where we talk to each other and with our staffs and the staff of WFRC. So um, I, I welcome you and look forward to working with you uh, and uh, I think you'll appreciate the contribution that you'll get to make and the contribution that this 
organization makes to our region. So um, with that, I'll let you get back to it. And uh, and there will be a test on acronyms after this is over. So, uh, <laughs> OK. Thanks, thanks, so, thanks. thanks so much, Mayor Silvestrini. We'll let right. you get back to attempting to solve homelessness, at least in, in Salt Lake County. Thank you very All much. Right. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Um, so what you see on the screen here, and, and, and part of the reason we're doing this is we want you to, to know who our team is. Um, Ted Knowlton, our deputy uh, director, who I, I sometimes like to refer to as, as, uh, as uh, Utah's uh, lead planner. Um, uh, Ted's the uh, um, former president of the Utah chapter of the uh, American Planning Association, and also has increased street cred because he's a city council member for North Salt Lake City. Miranda Jones Cox, who is our government affairs manager, you should be getting, and if you don't get them, let us know, you should be getting her excellent government affairs updates uh, every, uh, every week. Mike Sobchak, who um, joined us relatively recently is our communications manager and would love to work with you and your communities to help tell your stories about the great work that you're doing. Um, next slide is a few more of our terrific staff uh, uh, Ned Hacker, operations, and, and you can see their names here, Kurt Maurer, our CFO, uh, and Marion Florence, who's our newest staff person. Uh, Kurt and Marion work to make sure that we are making prudent and careful and transparent use of public resources, the, the dollars that we have um, uh, and that we expend on, on uh, behalf of all of our communities here. Uh, Amber from HR, Andrea, who I've already referred to also, um, and Rosie, we have such a great team here. You'll, you'll get introduced to a few more people as we go through. Um, I've just got one more slide I'm gonna cover and then, I'm gonna, um, then I'm, we're gonna move on to sort of to the substance here. Um, here's the overall structure. Now, some of you are here for, for various uh, committees. Um, hopefully as you look at this, you say, aha, there's the committee that I serve on. Um, like, like Shannon, for example, Marsha said, right, Shannon, uh, in, in by virtue of her private sector role, serves on the Wasatch Front Economic Development District. Um, the Wasatch Front Regional Council itself, the governing body uh, that Mayor Silvestrini is the chair of, as you see, is made up of uh, 19 uh, city and county elected officials that are appointed by uh, the county Cox. And you all know this, most of you went through that process. We, I came to the Mayor Pullman for Davis, for example, shepherded that process through the Davis COG and doing those appointments. Um, and then we also have uh, uh, the directors of UDOT and UTA and then non-voting members, representatives from the legislature, in other words, as our, uh, as our um, governing body. And then I'm not gonna go through all of this, but you see all of these committees um, that feed into ultimately the work of the regional council. And you might think, my gosh, that's a lot of committees. And it is. We like our committees. But the point of it is that we work to bring people together on, on lots of key issues and work to try to build consensus uh, for the future of the region, the direction we're going. When I say build consensus, that does not mean, and I want to make a really clear point about this, that does not mean that anybody at WFRC, the staff or the organization, is going to tell you what you should do in your community. That's your job. You know your communities the best. Our goal is to help you achieve your objectives. And we have resources and staff and information. And maybe we can help you with that and help you look at your issues within a broader regional context, a longer term context, as I said. But we're here to help you not to try to uh, supplement or not to supplant your decision making. You're the experts for your communities. The only thing I wanna mention here is that bottom row, one more thing, Mike, that bottom row, the technical advisory committees, that's the staff. We have a whole group of staff members that participate uh, and they get into the details of allocating funding for transportation projects and otherwise. So it's critical that not only you as elected officials, but also your staff are involved and I'll just tell you, we've just the cities and the counties have amazing uh, staff that work with them, and we love working with them as we go. Okay, uh, with that introduction, um, I'm going to turn it over to Ted Knowlton, our deputy director, to talk about the Wasatch Choice Regional Vision, and we'll just roll from there. Ted, take it away. 
Andrew, thanks a lot. And it's a great privilege to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, thanks for spending time with us. So you all know that Utah is the fastest growing state, number one in the last 10 years. And there's this looming question of what are we gonna do collectively to address the demands of our growing population? Um, I'm gonna tell you about a plan that serves as the foundation for the more specific planning products that WFRC produces. And that, that's called the Wasatch Choice uh, Vision. Mike, if you can go to the next slide. So I'm waiting for it. There we go. Um, this answers this question uh, of, so where are we going with all this growth? Utah's growing, but the good news is we have worked together to produce a collaborative plan, Wasatch Choice 2050. This is essentially uh, local governments uh, looking at the horizon of the next few decades, uh, working with transportation agencies to think about how do roads, transit, trails, land development, economic development, how do those pieces work together? You can think about how significant over time uh, decisions like where an I-15 interchange is or where a light rail station is, how significant it affects your community. The idea with Wasatch Choice is let's think ahead in advance about how those pieces come together with an eye towards improving our overall quality of life. You can see the list of partners there on the right, um, a lot of partners. Everything that you see that represents your local government and land use and economic development came directly from local governments. Let me tell you a little bit more about Wasatch Choice, Mike. So uh, again, boy, I've got a lot of lag on my side. Local land use, regional transportation, economic development. It covers a geography from Brigham City in the north down all the way through Santa Quinn into the Mountain Land Association of Governments area, inclusive of the Wasatch back in the Tooele Valley. Big geography. I'm gonna zoom in just to Salt Lake County to illustrate what is in Wasatch Choice. Um, if Mike, if you'll go to the next slide. So here we zoomed into Salt Lake County and uh, what you'll see is essentially, uh, it's a skeleton of how growth might unfold. Key decisions about land development, transportation infrastructure and open space. I'm gonna pull it apart and I'm gonna show you the layers and how they work together. Uh, next one, next. So you'll see a road uh, system. This is getting in your time machine, landing in the horizon year of our planning, 2050. What are all of the roads, major regional roads that will exist in 2050 according to plan? And next, the major transit lines. Added to that, Mike, the uh, major trails. How do we get around by bike and on foot? Uh, those major components of that. Next. How do those three things then work with areas where you local governments feel like, look, these are the best places for growth and intensification, economic development, downtowns, uh, maybe more intense forms of housing. We call them centers. This, these, uh, these polygons that you see here were all identified and deliberated by local governments, uh, they saying, look, look, within this overall framework of the Wasatch Choice, where do we think the best places for growth are? This answers that question, how should growth unfold? And this is dovetailed in our planning with those previous transportation lines. Go to the next one, Mike. And of course, you've got to include open space uh, and land conservation in that as well rounding out that picture of a collaborative plan. Next. I'm trying to see what, what oh, there. See, we, we forgot to add the, the uh, music. We're taking nominations for the soundtrack for the very last slide. But it brings everything together. This uh, was a a, a rigorous process where we tested ideas. We talked 
together with our boards and committees about the consequences of one pattern or another and what this means for quality of life. Now, this vision rests on four overarching uh, strategies. Next slide. And Ted, just so you know, it's moving faster for us than it appears to be for you. So we're seeing it's it. It's just my luck. Okay. <laughs> um, choices. Uh, people have different wants and needs when it comes to transportation. Let's provide a lot of choices and people can pick what works best for them. Housing options. Let's support a variety of housing options as you see fit in, in your community. Three, let's preserve open space and not wish that we had done that. Uh, when we look back in the rearview mirror. And importantly, let's tie these decisions together. Let's link where we locate jobs, where we allow housing to occur, um, how it works with transportation. Let's be purposeful about how those things line up geographically. And then, uh, so that's really the crux of Wasatch Choice. So that acts as the foundation. You're gonna hear about the regional transportation plan. That's the transportation element of Wasatch Choice. You're gonna hear a little bit about the comprehensive economic development strategy, the economic development component of it, your local land use general plans. That's the land use component of Wasatch Choice. They come together in that shared framework of Wasatch Choice. You'll hear a lot about this. Uh, you hopefully already have. A key takeaway, this came from you. It came from local governments and it's collaborated. It's living, it can be changed. We're constantly wanting to understand where uh, communities want to make changes and how it can be remain our collective approach to how we maintain and ensure high quality of life as uh, Utah continues to grow. Mike, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is something you can explore and really we'd love you to explore it. Go to uh, the this map, um, a staff person is going to put it into the chat box, but you'll see what you can do is you can zoom in. You see these tabs, vision, transportation, land use, economic development, recreation. You can go to any one of those tabs and zoom into particular details. This is a, a map that has information on it. You click on an item, it gives you the details. So um, please take a look at that, explore it. And uh, again, remember that it is a living document and we look forward to collaborating with you on an ongoing basis with this. Uh, Mike, I think I'm gonna hand the baton now over to uh, the Long Range Plan team. So uh, Jory and company, take it away. Thanks, Ted. Um, all right, so Jory Johnner, Director of the Long Range Planning Group. Uh, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes to introduce you to the Wasatch Front Regional Transportation Plan and the Utah uh, Unified Transportation Plan. At any point, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Uh, next slide, Mike. Um, members of the Long Range Planning Team include uh, Julie Bjornstad, our senior planner. Uh, she's in charge of financial modeling, external forces and policies, resiliency, and helps Andrew um, and Miranda with uh, policy analysis and is on the, is the Morgan County uh, liaison and uh, leads the MPO or that the MPO or the RPO up there. Uh, Hugh Van Wagenen is our active transportation planner and not only works on the long range plan, but also helps uh, local communities with funding and implementation, active transportation tours, and as our staff lead for our active transportation committee. Uh, Lauren Victor focuses on transit planning and leads our equity work. And then Nikki Navio leads our long range road planning and studies and focuses on freight and safety planning. Uh, so why is the regional transportation plan important? Um, one thing, uh, acronym, uh, you may hear this uh, called RTP. So uh, just throwing it out there, but I'll do my best not to use that uh, today. So, um, the regional transportation plan is where projects are born. It's the first step in moving from an idea to improving and enriching people's lives. Um, transportation projects are required to be on our regional transportation plan in order to be considered for state transportation dollars, federal transportation dollars administered by WFRC, uh, some of the corridor preservation funds and some of the local option sales taxes. Uh, UDOT, UTA, federal government, state leaders all base their conversations about the future of transportation on this regional transportation plan. So uh, hopefully that gives you a, a high level uh, 
reason why we're, this is one of our key work items. Um, projects within the regional transportation plan are composed of roadway, transit, and active transportation projects. And as Ted made mention, uh, they are coordinated with our land use, um, our land use, your land use, shall I say. Um, the plan is developed and updated on a four-year cycle. Uh, it's financially constrained, meaning that we identify funds to build, operate, and maintain transportation. Um, and as you know, there is always more need than funds. So uh, we, we, have to, we have to work through that constraint. And then finally, it conforms to our air quality uh, budgets, um, which uh, is a requirement we have. And uh, it's also phased or prioritized by decade. So you can see the, the buckets down there with the phasings at the bottom of that slide. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the plan is multimodal. So road projects could include new construction, widening, operational, safety, and corridor preservation. Whereas transit projects include uh, core bus routes, bus rapid transit, rail, and even uh, some new stations and park and ride lots. Active transportation projects include uh, planning for pedestrian and bicycles, including gate grade separated crossings, protected bike paths, and new trails. Um, this is a high level overview of our 2023 to 2050 our, uh, regional transportation plan process. Uh, we broke it into three stages from exploring technologies and policies in stage one, uh, which we did in 2020, to testing scenarios and drafting a preferred scenario in stage two, which took place. Uh, just last year. And then we're now moving into finalizing and phasing projects in stage three with the final adoption of the plan in May of 2023. Um, as you can see in all these stages, we've worked very closely with our local communities, our transportation partners, UDOT and UTA, coordinated with key stakeholders and um, public outreach. Looking ahead uh, more specifically to 2022 this year, um, we'll use comments on the project ideas you recommended at the last workshop and make adjustments to our project list. Um, we're going to refine population employment projections, which I believe Susie uh, may hit a little bit when she uh, in the next section of our analytics group. Um, and we're going to begin to prioritize and phase projects based on the needs and review financial constraints, um, projections, and the funding availability um, in that uh, third third piece there. And then we're going to financially constrain the projects. So we will bring back a financially constrained list of projects, um, not just a list, but in a map form too, to you in our next uh, fall workshops of 2022. And those are normally um, take place in October and November. Um, and we invite um, all the elected officials, uh, mayors, um, commissioners, city council members, planning commissioners, and key staff from each of the communities along with UDOT and UTA and um, some other key partners. So um, again, looking for the final approval to be spring of 2023 by the regional council. So please encourage your planners to attend and participate in their regional growth committee technical advisory committees. Um, that's where we will be taking a lot of our work over the upcoming months um, to get uh, to bounce some ideas off or keep everybody up to speed. So encourage them to attend those meetings. Um, and help us remain with the remaining items. Last slide here, um, before I hand it off to Susie, is to highlight just the unified, the Utah's Unified Transportation Plan, which is um, an effort that includes all of the state's metropolitan planning organizations, which are MPOs, UDOT and UTA. And all long range plans in the state of Utah are coordinated on a variety of levels and ultimately combined into uh, this Unified Transportation Plan. Uh, we've coordinated on financial assumptions, statewide performance measures, mapping, active transportation for nearly two decades. And I believe we're still remain the only state to kind of do this um, collaboratively um, into one plan. So with that, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'll sure. take them now. If not, I'll hand it off to Susie. Andrew? Jory, I want to make one uh, quick comment. Mike, would you go back one slide, please? This notion that all of the transportation agencies and uh, including in the involvement of the cities and counties collaborating together to identify the priority transportation needs across the entire state. Again, this does not happen everywhere. Uh, Utah is known nationally and has received awards actually nationally for our unified transportation planning process that's based on good information and good data 
and good analysis, which you're going to hear about in a, in a moment, and your engagement in this process. So you're participating through WFRC and in other ways in identifying what the priorities are for transportation investment is part of a larger process. And I will tell you, it works in that our investment in transportation per capita has been at the highest or among the highest of any state in the nation and the performance of our transportation systems, despite the challenges we face, because we're the fastest growing state in the nation, um, uh, is recognized as being um, top notch around the country. In fact, recently, Miranda and I and several of the WFRC members were in Washington DC and meeting with our peers, as well as the members of our congressional delegation. And the fact that we have an organized, unified transportation plan where we've together prioritize what the key investments are, puts us in really good standing to not just use our funds prudently and effectively, but to be in a great position to compete for uh, funding for projects from the federal government and from other sources. So I just wanted to highlight this uh, collaborative approach that we take to working together and thinking about the future. Thanks, Jory. Andrew, one thing before you unmute, um, Wendell, uh, Wendelin, um, shot me a direct message, just asked if I could explain um, how legislation, uh, legislature's appropriations for active transportation from last year yep. um, and this year fit into the entire structure. So I'm gonna kick that over to you or Miranda. Yeah, I'll give you the, I'll give, it's a great question. I'll give you the short answer. Basically, when the legislature authorizes funding for transportation, which they did last year, which we'll see what the ultimate is over the course of the next uh, week, but we anticipate there will be more um, legislative authorization of funding for transportation. Basically what happens is that those funds are used for the projects that come out of the unified transportation plan. And that's true for active transportation as well. We've worked together bike projects. We've worked together to identify through this process, the regionally important active transportation projects for using biking as a means of, trans of commuting. Um, and uh, the legislature provides funding through UDOT and the State Transportation Commission, and they allocate those funds to that list of regionally important projects that emerge through this collaborative process. And we think, what we're hoping is, we'll get more money for active transportation this year in addition to transit and roadway funds. Good question. Okay, next person. Yes, so our team seen here on the right and led by Bert Granberg is made up of a collection of transportation engineers and data scientists. We are primarily responsible for the modeling, forecasting and geographic information systems development work done that helps facilitate and support analyses done by all the groups here at WFRC. Um, the key purposes for this analysis work is to better understand existing transportation land use conditions, explore scenarios relative to future needs, constraints and goals, and to provide shared data and tools that inform project prioritization, project studies, and other decision-making. Some of the key questions that modeling and forecasting work looks to understand are where will development happen, where will new development happen? What is the magnitude of growth forecasted for the region and where will those people choose to live and work? How will we get there? And how well does our transportation system and land use pattern, patterns perform together? Um, a geographic information system is a database wherein location is the central organizing principle for storing, analyzing, and visualizing information. We utilize GIS here at WFRC to gather key info and feedback from partners and public, do map-based analysis, open sh openly share planning-related data, and communicate with stakeholders. Some of the resources we have to help access and see the work that we do include um, our map gallery, our map of the month series, we have access to opportunities and model and forecasting web, page, web pages for you to peruse. And we also have an open data site at data.wfrc.org. And with that, I'll pass the baton on to Wayne. Susie, before Wayne jumps in, I wanted to just highlight really quickly how widely used the products are from the analytics group that you just heard about. So when UDOT studies the idea of adding a lane on an interstate, UTA does a major effort like point of the mountain transit. Um, any major transportation study analysis 
across the greater Wasatch Front, it's using these models. So they're, they're born and maintained here for a lot of different use cases. So I just wanted to highlight that really important role that this group plays. Wayne, back to you. Thank you. Uh, as Jory mentioned, major capacity projects, or in other words, when lanes are added or new roads are built, or when major transit capital uh, projects come online, um, those projects have to be included in the regional transportation plan. Once uh, specific funding has been identified and committed to a project, then that uh, major capacity project can move into what's known as the transportation improvement program. Next slide. And uh, I get the pleasure of uh, leading the short range planning group um, with Ben Withrich as the uh, senior transportation engineer and responsible for the transportation improvement program. Um, and Kip Billings, uh, also a senior transportation engineer and our air quality analyst or specialist um, for the region. And so the, the transportation improvement program not only contains those major capacity projects that I just mentioned, but any other highway transit or active transportation project in the region also must be included in the TIP, in the Transportation Improvement Program, uh, regardless of whether it's federally funded, state funded, or locally funded. Uh, next slide. The TIP is made available for public review uh, each July, and it must be approved by both the Regional Council and uh, the State Transportation Commission, which usually occurs in August of each year. Next slide. So uh, WFRC administers three federal funding programs that are specifically for transportation construction. And um, those, with those three programs, I, I just encourage you to this coming uh, late August, early September, watch for a request from WFRC for a letter of intent for uh, projects for these funding programs, as well as for the transportation and land use connection program, which uh, funds planning uh, work uh, that local communities are, would like to do. And uh, so this uh, timeline here just outlines how we received letters of intent in the September October timeframe and then uh, evaluation, project evaluation concept reports or applications in the November, December timeframe, and then an evaluation process. And then through uh, some of the committees uh, that Andrew showed earlier, uh, recommendations are made as to which uh, projects receive funding and those three, uh, the new projects for those three programs, as well as the three programs in their entirety are included in that uh, transportation improvement program, along with all the other state funded and federal funded uh, highway transit and active transportation projects in the region. Next slide. All I wanna point out uh, with this slide is that the amount of requests we've received uh, in each of the urbanized areas, Ogden Layton is shown here. Uh, the amount of requests received exceed, significantly exceed uh, the amount of funding available. Next slide. And same thing for uh, the Salt Lake West Valley urbanized area. But nonetheless, even, even though uh, funding is uh, 
there's not as much available to as requests that come in. Uh, we're still able to uh, help local communities throughout the region uh, make significant improvements uh, to transportation infrastructure in the region. So thank you. Hey, Wayne, uh, perhaps it's worth noting or just emphasizing the work that Wayne is talking about on the transportation improvement program over the next four to six years or so is, is uh, under the purview of Transcom. That is one of our key committees we talked about before. The work that Jory was talking about a few minutes ago, the regional transportation plan, uh, and the work that Ted was talking about, the Wasatch Choice Vision, which look out decades in the future, are under the purview of the Regional Growth Committee. So the topics, these focal topics get talked about and housed within these different committees, and then it all feeds up to the full Wasatch Front Regional Council. Great point. Thank Thanks, you. Wayne. Megan or uh, whoever from the community and economic development team will hand it over to you. Thank you, Wayne. Hi, I'm Megan Townsend. Um, I'm our community and economic development director. I'll start by introducing the rest of our team. So this is the community and, and economic development team. We have Christy Dahlberg on our team, one of two community development planners. Michaela Jordan is our other community development planner. And we have Marsha White. Marsha is our regional economic development planner. Um, and many of you may also know her as an Ogden City Council person. Our group works at the nexus of transportation, land use, and economic development. So really bringing those three um, areas together. together. Oh, uh, I'm getting feedback. Okay, there we go. Bringing together the transportation, land use, and economic development functions of um, both the work you do within your cities and our Wasatch Trace vision. We deal mostly in technical assistance and local implementation. Um, you, can, you can think to call us if you have a, a planning need, a, an economic development question, um, all of those things, we're, we're here to help. That's really where, why our group is here along with um, the great staff at Wasatch Front Regional Council overall. Um, we have three main areas of focus. That would be our transportation and land use connection program. Uh, Mike, would you mind going back just to that one more? Thanks. We have three main areas of focus. That would be our TLC program, the Transportation and Land Use Connection, our Wasatch Front Economic Development District, and our Small Cities Community Development Block Program, the Block Grant Program. Those are going to be the three things we'll talk with you mainly about today, um, and I'm going to talk about our TLC program. So this is our Planning Technical Assistance Program. It's here for all, all of your planning needs. I think it, it really, really diving into your local issues. Um, we fund most types of planning as long as it's linking that transportation and land use um, elements together. Um, this is a partnership between the Wasatch Front Regional Council, UDOT, UTA, and Salt Lake County. You can go ahead and advance, Mike. Thank you, he's trying to speed me along. Um, these are our program goals. The Transportation and Land Use Connection supports local governments in their planning efforts, implementing the Wasatch Choice Regional Vision. Projects are, that are eligible, eligible are those that meet these goals. So maximize the value of investment in public infrastructure, enhance access to opportunities, increase travel options to optimize mobility and create communities with opportunities to live, work and play. Over the years, our funding has grown. This is still a relatively new program for the Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, began in two, 2014. As you can see in 2017, we formalized um, a, a couple of additional partnerships with UDOT and UTA and our funding has grown uh, incrementally throughout the years. It's about a uh, $1.9 million program annually. TLC meets you wherever you are. So if it's, if it's a high level vision, if we need to think through um, you know, uh, overall visioning, maybe it's a uh, really heavy community engagement, but we'll meet you there. Um, we can help you with policies, so zoning ordinances, um, design standard street connectivity ordinances, all of those things, as well as, as really thinking through that final implementation step. Maybe it's a, a market analysis to see really what, what, what we need to dive into to improve um, the way that your, your center is coming along. Maybe it's a parking study. Right, those kinds of analyses are also eligible through the TLC program. Um, and it's, it's notable here that the, the TLC partners aren't just funding partners. 
UDOT, UTA, Salt Lake County, they can come to the table um, within these projects to really make that final um, deliverable, implementable, align your, your visions for the same corridor, those types of things. So that's TLC in a nutshell. And please, as always, reach out. I'm going to drop our team's emails into the chat and then turn it over to Marsha to talk about economic development. Thanks, Megan. Um, as Megan said, I'm Marsha White. I'm the economic development uh, planner for WFRC. And um, I get the great role of being the, um, uh, uh, I get to look over the uh, Wasatch Front Economic Development District. If you wanna advance the slide next. Mike, thanks, I appreciate that. So as we already talked about, there's seven um, areas, uh, associations of government. We are one of seven. In addition, we are one of seven economic development districts. So each of these districts also have economic development districts, or each of these AOGs have economic development districts. Um, as you can see, we support um, economic development plans, and I like to say both local and regional plans. And then you can read the rest. But I think the, the thing that I have been uh, spending a lot of time with in the last uh, few months is the attraction of federal money. So the EDA is um, uh, funding a lot of money. And so um, hopefully we can uh, get some more and attract some more of those uh, dollars to our state. Um, we work with different organizations in the state of Utah, and you can read through that universities, chambers, and those kind of. Um, uh, different businesses. And we are one of the, I, I, I like to call us one of the three le legs of the stool that we have at WFRC. So we've got the regional transportation plan, we've got the local um, land use, um, and then the comprehensive economic development strategies. Um, these strategies all are strategic. Um, they support the Wasatch Choice vision. Um, we know that we are growing and we want to have a quality of life as we grow. And so these strategies fit right into trying to figure out how to not just grow um, with, um, you know, just economic opportunities, but how to do that within it, um, the constraints of the Wasatch Choice vision. And so you can see that we have four strategies, all of which have objectives and actions and, and performance measures uh, attached. We have to do this every five years as the EDA has uh, asked us to do it. So uh, we will be coming up on a new uh, strategy here in the next few years or next year, I guess. So with that, that's basically the, the economic development side. I think um, I'm gonna turn it over to Christy. Thanks, Marcia. Um, so as Marcia mentioned, I'm Christy Dahlberg and in addition to Working on the TLC program, I also administer the CDBG Small Cities Program or Community Development Block Grant Program. Thank you. Um, so it's a funded by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development or HUD, and it's a competitive grant program that we administer for Morgan, Tooele, and Weber counties, excluding Ogden City. Um, so if that if you think that excludes you, it may exclude you from our CDBG program, but um, if we don't administer it for you, that means that your community um, administers its own community development block grant program. And if you have any questions, you can still feel free to reach out to me and I'll do my best to connect you with um, the person who will administer it for you and your community. <clears throat> the primary objective of CDBG is to provide decent housing and a suitable living environment, principally for persons of low to moderate income. And in this next funding cycle, we anticipate we'll have um, about $1,050,000 to administer. So just a quick list of um, examples of projects that can be funded using CDBG. We've got a bunch of construction projects, water, sewer, ADA, street improvements. Um, it can also purchase fire and safety equipment, um, perform housing rehab or rental assistance programs, as well as um, senior and community centers, as well as public service facilities. Um, so before I turn it back over for the um, civil rights training, um, Megan dropped my contact information in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions about any of these programs, feel free to reach out to anyone at WFRC and we'll make sure to put you in contact with the right person. And now I'll turn it back over to Andrew to talk about the board. Thanks so much, uh, Christy. Uh, folks, that gets us through the end of our staff uh, sharing information with you. We've only got one other substantive portion of this um, uh, new member orientation, which is showing a video about 
uh, civil rights. And of course, we all know uh, that in the expenditure of public funds, we have to comply with all the applicable legal standards. Uh, and in a very important set of those standards are the civil rights legislation. Um, and uh, so we've actually been encouraged to share this information with, with you, with our new members, um, by our friends at uh, USDOT, the United States Department of Transportation, um, as because the, the distribution of our funding has to comply and, and ensure that it's not discriminatory in any way. We, we take that seriously. Um, before we go on, that's like, a, like an 11 minute video. That's gonna be the last thing we're gonna do in this meeting. Before we do that, I just wanna just for a moment, open it up and just see, we've thrown a lot of information at you. Um, uh, hopefully uh, this information made sense to you. You got, the, you got, the, sen you got the, the sense from talking with us and hearing from us that we have resources and a team that is here to help you. Um, the way for uh, you to, be, to best be involved is participate in the committees, make sure that your staff participates in the working groups, um, engage in also your member organizations, the League of Cities and Towns and the Association of Counties with which we partner very, very closely. Um, and my, my sort of bottom line is, uh, I'll say it again, it's where I started, is uh, a thank you to you uh, for, for putting yourself out there, for working hard, for um, taking on this sometimes thankless job of, of being public officials uh, because it's all about um, uh, caring for your communities, uh, your residents, and trying to make sure that we have great quality of life for all of our communities for, for generations to come. And it is an honor for us at WFRC. You've met our terrific staff, or at least some of them, and the other staff that are on from other agencies here. It's really an honor to be able to do this work with you. We think it's important work for the future of our communities. And, and by working together, we can make a real difference in the lives of our uh, residents now and in the future. Um, I'm just gonna ask for a moment. Uh, we don't really have a lot of time and I know I actually have to uh, get back into a, uh, a legislative negotiation uh, meeting that's starting at 2.30. But I'm just wondering if there's anybody on here that's like, like totally puzzled about something important or has some burning issue um, I don't really want to dive into a bunch of rabbit holes here. All of our staff is available and actually could, you know, may be able to hang on for a few minutes after if you have specific questions. But is there something in your mind that you're like, there's a particular thing that you guys didn't cover that I really wanted you to cover and just take a minute on that. I'm just going to open it up for just a sec on that line. Because if you're thinking it, other people probably are too. Um, Matt Jensen from West Haven, and I just wanted to make sure, can we get those slides? Just, you know, you've, you've got a lot of different acronyms and everything, and I'd mm -hmm. love to just to have that little cheater sheet if possible. You bet. We're happy to distribute the slides to everybody who's here today. Also, um, I'll just right now post our uh, webpage um, in the chat. Uh, pretty straightforward, but we've got a lot of great info, but we're happy, to, uh, Matt, to send the info around uh, the slide info as well. What else? Anybody? Okay. Now that our staff, anybody in staff going to say to me, I don't know why you didn't talk about X. And it'd be like, I'll say, oh, that's right. I forgot we were going to talk about X. Anybody on our team want to remind me of something we're supposed to talk about? Andrew, before they do, this is Commissioner Fackrell. Yes. Um, when are we having the economic development uh, meetings and discussions? Are they well, coming you know, up soon? Um, uh, uh, com uh, Commissioner slash grandpa, I will answer that question in this way. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Commissioner Fackrell uh, spends a lot of time taking care of his, his grandkids and he loves that role. So um, I I'll say this, we are um, we host meetings here at the Wasatch Front Regional Council offices, which is in on the west side of, of downtown Salt Lake, easily accessible by uh, I-15 and I-80, uh, front runner and tracks. Um, we have been largely virtual for the past two years. 
Um, and uh, that was part of why I was asking at the beginning of this meeting if, uh, or early as folks were coming on, are, are most of you back in your offices? And my sense is you are. And so commissioner, um, I anticipate that in the relatively near future, we're gonna start having our meetings hosted here, located here at WFRC again. And we're really looking forward to that. So um, stay tuned for those announcements. Uh, we also have the ability to participate uh, remotely by Zoom, but everybody will get notices. And Andrea has also sent out to everybody um, calendar invites for the, for the meetings, for the committees you're on. Um, we have an overall calendar. Uh, and as a follow-up to this meeting, we're more than happy to share the slides as well as the, count, the overall calendar for our, our meetings as well. Andrew, Anything else? What, one thing, there was a question in the chat if, um, you know, what's the best way to make sure that the right staff people are included in our technical advisory committees? And so um, send those names um, to Rosie, I believe is keeping that contact list and sending out the invitations and the agendas. Um, ben Wuthrich um, coordinates the, the transcom tax and I do with myself and Ted do the RGC tax. So um, hit us up if you're unsure if they're on the list or if you know of some staff, um, send us their contact info and we'll make sure we can get them added. And we'll include a, a point about that in the follow-up email um, that we send out here uh, as well. Okay, we wanna make it real easy for your folks to be engaged. Can I add one thing as well? Um, those of you that have been involved with WFRC over time know that we do an annual big reach out to communities to share draft plans and products, gather feedback. So that's a really important thing that we do. Look for that. That's not your only shot as an overall community. If you're interested in talking through, sharing information, gathering information, getting an overview, anything like that, we love to do that. Uh, if you're interested in, in some customized attention, nothing would make us happier uh, with your community. Okay, last chance for any other comments or questions. Feel free uh, to get in touch with any of us. We'll send follow-up information. Thank you for taking time with us. Thanks for the work you do. Uh, thanks for letting us partner with you in doing it. We're now gonna to turn to the uh, 11 minute video. Um, I'm gonna sign off and uh, Andrea, I'm gonna hand the baton to you to uh, make sure we close it out here, okay? Thanks everybody so much. The United States shall, shall on the ground of race, color, color or, or national origin, be excluded from be participation in, be denied, denied the benefits of, of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity, activity receiving federal, federal financial, financial assistance. assistance. Hello, I'm Jim Vance. Decades have passed since the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial here in Washington, D.C. But discrimination is still a problem in these United States. And discrimination prohibited by Title VI can be among the most difficult yet important to recognize and understand. It means that all people in this country are entitled to equal treatment by federally funded programs or services, be they police, parks and recreation, education, health care, transportation, or anything else. It was President Lyndon Johnson who signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. At the time, many people called it the most important piece of civil rights legislation since the Emancipation Proclamation outlawed slavery about 100 years earlier. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 aimed to end discrimination based on race, color, or national origin. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act specifically focuses on programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance, often in the form of grants. The goal of Title VI is voluntary compliance, and recipients must be given opportunities to voluntarily comply when violations are found. But if that cannot be achieved, federal financial assistance may be withdrawn. And the top priority is preventing discrimination in the first place. But to do that, you must understand the requirements of Title VI. While in some cases the discrimination is against an entire group of people, 
In other cases, it targets an individual. Let's look at the case of Mr. Michael Burley. Mr. McSherry, look, I've got to go. I've been pushing you to all the local accounting firms, and I'm sure something will pan out. Hi. Who did you say you were? We spoke on the phone a couple of days ago. I'm Michael Burley, the civil engineer who just moved to town. Oh, yes, I remember you. You said you had a degree from Stanford. That's me. Graduated top of the class, 1979. Do you have any proof of that with you? <laughs> well, no. I could get you proof, though. My word is good, let me assure you. <laughs> Mr. Burley, I don't doubt your credibility. It's just that I have to make sure that the resumes I submit to my clients are accurate. Now, may I see yours? Here you are. Looks like you moved around a lot. Well, it's a sacrifice I've made in order to help my wife further her career. I've always held my job once I obtained them, though. It's still very hard to recommend a candidate who's never held one job for longer than, what do we have here? Four years. There's a bright side to it. All that moving around has given me lots of experience in other forms of engineering. Let's see what I can do. Well, thank you so much for seeing me. Hi, Joanna, Michael Burley here. It's been three weeks since we last talked. Back then, you said you hadn't found a position for which to submit my resume. Hold on, let me get your file. Nope, nothing yet. But I don't understand what the holdup is. You serve a large area, and I told you that I'm willing to commute. Surely there must be some job that I'm at least qualified to apply for. So far, nothing matches your experience and qualifications. Well, what about that Lansbury Bridge project I told you I'd heard about? They're hiring a civil engineer. You said that job was being filled internally. I looked in the newspaper yesterday, and it was being advertised. I call over there. They tell me they've reviewed several applications from your employment office, and I wasn't one of them. Mr. Burley, I only submit resumes for people whom I think are qualified. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I have more than eight years' experience designing bridges. Mr. Burley, if you're that desperate to work, I've got some construction foreman positions I could recommend you for. In fact, Michael Burley is qualified for the civil engineering position involving the construction of the Lansbury Bridge. He has more experience than three of the applicants Joanna sent over for the job. All the applicants Joanna sent to the company hiring a civil engineer were white. Construction foreman. I don't think so. I sense something really wrong here, and I'm going to file a discrimination complaint. Mr. Burley was correct. He was experiencing intentional discrimination or disparate treatment when his application was intentionally and unjustifiably treated differently by Joanna. Title VI prohibits retaliation, just as it prohibits discrimination. As we mentioned earlier, sometimes an entire community can be a victim of discrimination. Often, violations involve what would seem to be innocuous locations, such as your community's parks. Take a look at the houses in the affluent Sunnyvale side of town. They're big, with big yards. Now, here are the homes in the Latino neighborhoods. They are row houses, very tightly packed. So, block for block, you have a lot more people living in the minority community. So the parks get a lot more use. For that reason, it's more likely the equipment will be in poor condition and in need of more frequent repairs. Let's look at the case of Mrs. Xuan Nui. She is a member of a substantial Chinese community being served by her local police department. She's coming to police today after she discovered her house was ransacked. <laughs> 请帮助我,我不知道该怎么办,我刚回到家就发现家已经被抢劫了,所有的东西都被偷走了。Do you speak English? 我只会讲中文,我们全家刚到美国两个多月,我们... Hold on. Do you have a friend that speaks English? I need English. No, English,我只会讲中文. Police services are vital to all people in this country not just those who speak English. In this case, the officer tried to work with Mrs. Yi, but he couldn't communicate with her. Ultimately, he denied her a service and may have violated Title VI. Let's take a look at how this scenario could have played out had proper LEP guidelines been in place at the police station. No. Oh, okay. 
Hold, hold on a second. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Captain Carlson, Officer Johnson down here. I have a woman that doesn't speak a word of English. Um, she picked the Mandarin I speak card. Is Officer Wang around to translate? He's not up there. Okay, no, I'll use the phone company's translation service. Yeah, our uh, police department has a contract with them. Language line, how can I help you? Yeah, I have a woman here that I believe speaks Mandarin Chinese. I'm going to put her on the line. Just a moment, please. 好的,女士,我会向警官解释你的情况。他会帮助你的。让我喝他通话。我需要警官的帮助,我的家被抢劫了,所有的东西都被抢光了,我的钱和我的首饰,我只离家了一会儿。他通电话。Officer, this woman says her house has been robbed. Sounds pretty serious. Let's look at what went right this time. First, the officer was able to look at the police station's LEP guidelines, posted right at his place of work. Also, the officer was familiar with the community he serves. In this instance, the police department serves a large Chinese population, so it had hired a Chinese-speaking staff member. But when that staff member wasn't present, okay. Officer Johnson knew he had a plan B he could call his telephone company's translation service because he knew that the police department had a contract with them. And finally, the police station had vital documents translated into the oh, okay. woman's language. Okay. All right. The way agencies plan to handle people with limited English proficiency depends on four factors. One, the number or proportion of people with limited English proficiency served in the service population. Two, the frequency with which the LEP individuals come in contact with the program. Three, the importance of the service provided by the program. And four, the resources available to the participant. Most importantly, any recipient of federal funds must act as its own watchdog, carefully monitoring for possible violations. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is now and will continue to be an important piece of the foundation upon which we are building a better America. Title VI is a critical part of that law. For more information, you can contact the Justice Department at the toll-free numbers you see on the screen. Remember, all people have the right to programs and services that will enrich their lives. Don't let their race, color, or national origin stand in the way. Thank you everyone for attending today. And like Andrew and several others have mentioned, reach out to anyone here at the staff and we'll, when you're on staff and we'll be glad to give you more information and um, we'll be um, sending a follow-up email. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye you guys. <laughs>